All right. Good evening, everyone. So this is part two of chapter 11. Um, when we last left off, we had just watched the video on defense mechanisms. Um, we had also uh, reviewed, let me see here, just pop back here for a second. We had also reviewed um, Freud's id, superego, uh, ego, levels of consciousness. So just kind of um, catching up to where we were. And then we left off on defense mechanisms. Um, and remember from the video, and also I've shared this before, not only in this chapter, but previously, that um, Freud is considered the, uh, the father of, psychol of modern psychology, right? He came up with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, concepts in psychology that we still use today in some form or another. Defense mechanisms is, is one of those items. And, um, and that's what we had talked about last week. Um, the most famous ones I'm sure that you've heard of, of course, is denial, um, right? There's that joke that denial is not a river in Egypt. <laughs> um, uh, rationalization is another one that you'll probably hear about um, a lot. Projection is one where um, stuff you don't like uh, about yourself, you um, attribute to other people. So it's kind of like the, uh, if you spot it, you got it um, kind of rationale there. Um, and then they also talked about um, regression as being um, a, a defense mechanism. And this is where a person uh, returns to coping strategies of a less um, mature state. They become more childlike. Um, and uh, that one's a little bit rarer. You don't, you don't see or hear a lot about that. Um, and again, uh, these are just some of the concepts and theories that, that um, or hypotheses, I should say, that Freud worked with. And, uh, and, and again, we still use some of them today. Uh, the other thing that Freud did that um, a lot of psychologists from Freud moving forward um, have uh, come up with stages of development. Now with Freud, if you recall from the human development chapter, um, that's why I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it. This is kind of a review. Um, his were, he named it the, st the stages of psychosexual development, right? Because he theorized that our personalities were basically formed in our childhood. And that's why it's in the, child, uh, in the personality chapter. Um, a person who is um, overeating, for instance, as an adult, right? Um, they smoke a lot, They're, they bite their nails, right? Um, Freud would say that that person had not resolved the oral stage, right? And so just to, I'm just using that as an example. He also, um, uh, put a lot of blame on the parents, the mother in particular. Um, you know, you would not ever describe Freud as a feminist. I'll just put it to you that way. Uh, he was very um, fixated on, on uh, uh, sexual urges, phallic, uh, phallic symbols. You remember, he's the one who came up with, um, you know, penis envy as... Um, as, as he described, um, all women have. I mean, he was very blunt with that. Um, so a lot of his theories have fell on, fallen out of favor. Some have uh, stuck on, some have been approved upon. Stages of development, I would say, would be one of those. Because uh, I think he was right. Human development, we do go through stages. Whether it's psychosexual, that's something else to be uh, determined, I guess, by a researcher smarter than me. But, so these are the stages. So first there was the oral stage and he described the importance of this stage, the erogenous zone being the mouth. Um, and if, you, if any of you have any kids, you know that everything goes into their mouth at that stage. Um, but by the way, that's also how they explore their world. So, you know, um, they also get their pleasure from eating and sucking and the major, conflict that they have during this time is being weaned from the bottle of the breast, right? 
can they do this successfully? And if they can't, then that's where their adult fixations come in. So if you, if you ever hear the term oral fixation, that's another example of some of Freud's terminology hanging on into the modern era. Penis envy is, is another one of those um, uh, terms that have hung on into the modern era. Then there's the uh, anal stage. Um, and in the anal stage, the erogenous zone is the anus. Um, and the child is said to derive pleasure from um, bowel and bladder movements, right? So using the restroom um, and the major conflict to be uh, taken care of there is toilet training. And if that conflict is not resolved, then another term from Freud that has carried on into um, modern day would be the um, term anal retentive. If you've ever heard of someone having an anal retentive personality, they tend to be wound up tight, they're stubborn, um, they have a need for order or neatness. Um, you know, I might look at that as maybe the individual is having some impulsive, um, uh, uh, sorry, some obsessive compulsive um, behaviors. Not sure if it was, you know, the inability to resolve the anal stage, but, but anal retentive, that's something you'll hear. Something you don't really hear a whole lot, or at least I don't, I should speak for myself, is anal expulsive personality. So this is a person who's messy, they're careless, they're disorganized. Um, and they also tend to be emotionally labile. In other words, they, they will go into outbursts, um, have emotional dysregulation, right? And then next is the phallic stage. And, um, and he hypothesized that, that this occurred between the ages of three and six. And the erogenous zones obviously are the, uh, the genitals at that point. And the major conflict here is the child having the desire for the opposite sex parent, and then also experiencing jealousy and hatred toward the same sex parent, right? And so this is where you had the, um, the Oedipus complex, which is boys desiring their mother's attention, and they have this urge to replace their father. And this is where the, the um, feelings of castration anxiety um, comes up for boys. And then the other, um, uh, the other complex is for girls and that's the Electra complex. And this is where the daughter is um, striving or has a strong desire for the father's attention and wants the mother out of the way, right? And then he also theorized, again, that um, all women, uh, and I believe it was all women, he theorized, had penis envy and were mad at their mother because they did not provide them with a penis. So that's, uh, that's Freud on penis envy and castration anxiety. And then the fixation uh, for the adult is, uh, if, if it's unresolved conflict, that they tend to be vain, um, overambitious, and uh, you know, just very, very, very competitive. Um, then there is the latency stage. Um, and remember, latency is used here because it's really something that you really cannot see. Um, there is no erogenous zone, as he described it. Um, and again, latent, because you can't see it, the sexual feelings are basically dormant in his mind um, uh, because the children are focusing on school, their friendships, um, their hobbies, uh, and they engage more with peers of the same sex. And then finally, the genital stage, which is uh, again, returns back to the genitals uh, because now we're talking puberty, there is a sexual reawakening um, and urges are redirected from the parents to more socially acceptable par uh, partners, right? So um, high school sweethearts, et cetera, right? 
Um, obviously, what this does not take into account is um, uh, sexual orientation. So you can see this is, in his mind, a very heteronormative way of looking at the world, um, if not, albeit, uh, a little sexist as well. So, all right, so that is Freud. So because Freud was the father of is considered the father of um, psychology, he did have a lot of students and a lot of people that followed his work, um, but they did make some changes, right? Uh, for instance, neo-Freudians really de-emphasized the sexual nature of, um, of, of human development as far as forging a person's personality. And the neo-Freudians are, are here in, in this section as well uh, because they, also believe that uh, personality is also the result of childhood experiences, but also as you'll see, for instance, like with Eric Erickson, that he believed personality developed throughout the lifespan, right? So, so let's talk about Adler first. So probably one of the things that you may have heard of, um, but you may not who it, know who it's attributed to, and that is if you've ever heard the term, um, inferiority complex. So it was really Adler that, that coined this phrase. And, um, and he, he said that because of a person's feelings of lack, lack of worth, um, they don't measure up to others, that they were really, their drives were focused on compensating for those feelings. So, um, so if you ever hear someone saying, oh, so-and-so is trying to overcompensate, that's really, overcompensation is really looking at an inferiority complex. And so he looked at things like social motives, right? He really believed that social motor motives were the force behind the way we think, feel, and behave, right? Um, <coughs> and he also placed heavy um, focus on social connections during childhood development. And he believed that happiness could be found in working together and for the betterment of all. And, um, and he also saw conscious processes as being um, really, really important. Um, also, if you've ever heard of birth order um, uh, shaping personality, um, he was also the one that came up with, with birth order. Uh, and he theorized that, um, you know, the firstborn was getting most of the attention from the parents. And then, you know, as later kids come along, uh, parents kind of change in their, in their um, interactions with the children. Maybe they get a little bit more uh, used to having kids because the first kid can always be, you know, <laughs> nerve wracking for the parents. Uh, but anyway, he, he believed that his interaction and birth, uh, that interaction and birth order really helped to shape um, a person's personality as well. And then he also identified three fundamental tasks, uh, what, what he called social tasks, that all of us need to experience, right? So first there's occupational tasks, right? So what do we do for a living? Where's our focus there? Then our societal tasks, um, and that's where we're looking at, at, at friendships. And also, he also focused on like um, being able to recognize uh, equal rights and equality of others. So that's part of his societal tasks. And then love tasks, finding that intimate, um, loving partnership that, uh, that he theorizes all humans crave, which is true. We are very social we are social animals, right? We're designed to be with each other. And then there's Eric Erickson. Um, he is, uh, like I said, he was one that believed that personality develops throughout the lifespan. And that, you know, as we progress through the stages um, of psychosocial development, that that has an impact on our, on our personality. And that uh, uh, 
he also, and, and you'll see here, oh, maybe let me do this, turn on my pointer. He also said that, you know, as, as we um, uh, go through these stages, the, the older we get, the further along we get, the more complex the stages are. And so, um, Let's see, I don't think I have a slide for, no, I don't. So we'll just talk about the uh, stages real quick. Uh, so if you remember, right, the earliest stage is trust versus mistrust. And that's where the infant learns to either trust the world or not trust the world based on the response on having their needs met, right? And then the next stage is, um, and, and by the way, that's infant. And then the next stage is a toddler um, this is where they're learning um, autonomy. Can they do things on their, their, you know, can they do things on their own, right? Um, and the, the conflict there is, is they either learn to do that um, or they experience shame and, shame and doubt, um, which can have an impact later on on their, on their personality as well. And then as a preschooler, then we are at initiative versus guilt. Um, can, can I... Um, uh, choose to do certain things on my own. Um, will I get in trouble if I do something, right? So initiative versus guilt. And then industry versus uh, inferiority. Um, uh, and that's in grade school. And then as a teenager, remember I, uh, in the development chapter, I said, but the, the teenager's job is to, I kind of made a joke out of it, um, but in some respects it's true. Um, their job is to kind of rebel. They're looking for their own identity. Um, they, uh, parents become less, not how, let me say, I was going to say less important. I don't know that that's an accurate way to portray it, but their peer groups become more prevalent, right? They're going to school um, and they're probably identifying more with their peer, peer groups than they are with, with their parents. They may keep things from their parents. They may not talk to them as much as they used to when they were kids. And again, that's all part of their, um, uh, of their developing their identity, right? And then as they get into young adulthood, then there's that intimacy versus isolation. Um, and this is where, you know, they're looking for love. Um, simple way of putting that. And then in middle age, uh, this is generative, uh, generativity, sorry, I mis, uh, misspoke, versus stagnation. And this is where they're, they're like looking um, around and they're like, am I being productive or am I, or am I stuck? And then the last stage, which is the older adult, um, this is 65 on up, um, they're, they're now at a place where they're kind of slowing down, but they're looking at their life um, and they're looking at it and they're either satisfied or they're dissatisfied with it. Um, person who's dissatisfied, they might fall into despair. That might be the, the grumpy neighbor that you experience because um, they're not happy. Um, and again, so this is an example of, of how a person's personality uh, progresses through these um, stages. Down here, they may have been happy-go-lucky. They get up here and they go, you know what, my life was a waste. Hopefully people don't experience that, but sure. Um, and, and they're unhappy about it. Or they look back and they go, you know, I've got, I've got my kids, I've got my grandkids, I've got my great-grandkids. I had a great career, you know, um, and, and they're happy with, with the way their life turned out. So. Um, any, uh, I know I went through that fast, but we spent a lot of time in, in chapter nine as well. Any questions on either the psychosexual stages of development from Sigmund Freud or the stages of psychosocial development from Erickson? And again, remember you can use the chat if you don't want to be heard on YouTube um, or you can just unmute. Uh, doesn't appear to be any. So remember, you can ask, uh, throw in a chat anytime, um, and I can circle back around if something didn't get answered. The other thing I want to point out again 
Remember, if you're reading really fast, if you're trying to answer a question, psychosocial and psychosexual can be very easily misread. So just be aware of that when you're doing your homework or taking, taking your exam. All right, let's see here. Sorry. Every time I use my pen, I have trouble forwarding to the next slide. Carl Jung is another individual that we um, have um, talked about in previous chapters, and we're revisiting it again in the personality chapter. And you'll recall that um, from the previous chapters, where we talked about his belief in the collective unconscious and archetypes. Um, we did not so much talk about persona um, as we are going to now. And this is another reason why he is in the personality chapter, as we'll see. But <coughs> he, he acknowledged the concept of like a, a personal unconscious, um, but he was also interested in exploring the collective unconscious, right? And so this is where he came up with the idea of archetypes. You know, if you look cross-culturally, there are a lot of similarities um, of common experiences with people around the world. We all have like the hero, for example. And um, so he really thought that there was an integration of, of unconscious archetypal aspects to the self-esteem um, as part of an individual's self-realization process. And so that's where the collective unconscious comes on for him. The other thing, the other concept he talked about was the idea of the persona. Um, and some of you may have heard this, this term before, before psychology. Um, if, you, if you've heard a psychology class before, you've certainly had it, but, uh, but out in the real world. Um, and a person's persona is this mask that we consciously uh, adopt. And it's, it comes from our conscious experiences, but also he says it comes from our collective unconscious, right? So let's go back to the idea of the archetype of the, of the hero, for example, um, or the, uh, well, I'm gonna stick with the hero. So, you know, generally the hero is somebody who is um, uh, outgoing, they accomplish things, um, everybody, everybody looks up to the hero, right? So a person that is taking on that type of uh, persona, and, um, and let me just back up for a second, this also kind of goes back to birth order. So if you have the, like the hero child, that tends to be the oldest, right? They tend to be very responsible, um, tend to be very, um, oh, what's the word? It, it's on the tip of my tongue. Conscientious. That's the other, that was the word that I was trying to think of. Um, they tend to be conscientious. They're on time. People look up to them, right? Um, and that might be a persona or a mask that a person puts on. And that it can also be situational too, by the way, right? Depending on the situation. I think one of the homework questions the, that I asked about was, you know, someone going for a job interview and he puts on a suit, you know, normally wears jeans and a t-shirt and doesn't like suits. But for the job interview, he's gonna put on a suit um, and he's gonna put on the idea or ha of having a professional persona in order to get the job, right? So remember, Persona is a mask that we wear. And that comes from Carl Jung. He also talked about the difference between extroversion and introversion. Um, and I'm sure everyone here has probably heard of introverts versus extroverts. You know, and, and the thing about the differences between the two, and we all know both of them, I'm sure, right? I'll give you an example. Like my boss, she is definitely an extrovert. She is energized by being with other people. Um, she'll be the one that will go, okay, hey, what are you doing for lunch? And she'll use terms like, oh, I like to, you know, I, let's go break bread, right? And for her, that's, that she gets her energy from being with others. Whereas introverts, 
um, they don't need the energy of others to be energized. They're quite content with um, being alone. Uh, they tend to avoid attention, whereas extroverts, they kind of seek attention. They like the attention. Um, uh, extrovert, uh, introverts will speak slowly and softly. Extroverts will uh, speak quickly and loudly. Um, introverts also tend to be very thoughtful before they speak. Um, you know, they will, you ask them a question, they will take a moment and they will think about what they want to say and how they want to say it. Whereas uh, an extrovert might think out loud. Oh, and by the way, as, as we're talking about these, and um, uh, there are going to be variations, right? If you think of like a continuum, right? From the pure introvert to the pure extrovert, and then people in between, right? So you can have um, someone that's closer to the middle between introverts and extroverts. Sometimes they like, they, they can be energized by being alone. Sometimes they can be energized by, with, uh, by being with others. Um, and so remember, uh, there's, a there's a continuum, some gradations here. Professor, uh, is that the, the word for ambivert, something like that, ambivert? Uh, ambivert, well, yes, because that would be someone that is of both. It's kind of like being ambidextrous, right? Uh, the ability yeah. to use both hands. Yes, great. I did a, I did a personal a personality test and I got pretty much 50-50, which no. it makes sense. Because yeah. sometimes like I, I like being alone. And of course, I like being around people too. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes sense. It, but it's funny because when I was younger, I was more like extrovert. And now that I'm becoming older, I'm more like introvert. Yeah, yeah. Is that, hey, is that common to happen? Um, you know, I think, you know, in the next thing we're going to talk about like person situation debate, right? So depending on the situation, um, your, your way of reacting may change, right? Um, I, so if you're asking me if I'm hearing anything abnormal, uh, no, <laughs> I, I am okay, not. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank No, you're, you're fine. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, and here's, and, and then you bring up another good point. So like, you know, throughout this whole chapter, we really talk about personality and theorists and you know, the biology of it and all this kind of stuff, you know, for the most part, a wide range of people, there's nothing wrong with people's personalities. People are people. We're just, we're just who we are. And remember what I'm, what I'm speaking of. And, you know, when I'm addressing this kind of stuff in class, I'm, I'm just, I'm saying on the spectrum of the, of, of what's the norm, what's expected, right? I'm not talking about individuals that may be experiencing um, symptoms of, you know, like mental health concerns or things like that. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about uh, the normal spectrum of human experience within, um, although I hate using that word normal, um, and I can't think of a better word at the moment, but, but just the, the, the spectrum of human experience um, outside of someone experiencing uh, you know, concerns about their mental health and, and, and things like that. Right? Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so anyway, so that's extroversion versus introversion. Um, and that's Carl Jung as well. And then um, Karen Horney, and that's how you pronounce her name, Horney. Um, she agreed with Jung about um, individuals having, you know, the potential for self-realization. Um, and she, she was actually one of the first women to be taught uh, psychoanalysis, um, one of the first female um, Neo-Fordians. And um, she came up with the term womb envy, and, um, which is interesting. Uh, she believed that, that men experienced womb envy because we could not give birth and totally disagreed with the idea of, of penis envy. Now, I do not know Karen Horney personally, but I've always wondered if she just came up with womb envy just to go opposite of penis envy and, and what, what her thoughts were really behind that. 
Um, and I'll be honest, I haven't really delved into that part of it. What I do like about her work is the coping styles that she said that children develop in order to relieve their anxiety, right? And so she had um, uh, three coping styles that she came up with. And one was moving toward people. And the idea behind moving toward people that in order to relieve our anxiety, we actually are seeking affiliation. We're seeking companionship. We're seeking uh, that, that interdependence um, with other people. And that as, uh, as adults, um, she theorized that, that this person might have an intense need for love and acceptance. And, and I'm gonna talk about um, her ideas around it being neurotic in a minute. So I'm just gonna go over these um, because I'll say on the face of it, I think everyone, it, according to, to, to Karen Horney, everyone experiences this. We all either are moving toward people, moving against people, uh, moving away from people. But what she said was, is that when it becomes over, um, uh, overly neurotic, which by the way, and those are her terms, um, and, and neurotic and neuroticism and that kind of stuff, that's a term that we really don't use anymore as much. I'm using it now because the book talks about it. I'm using it because that's the term that, um, that, that Karen Horn and I used. And you'll see it also in the five factor model of personality. Neuroticism is also on that scale as well. So um, my bet is, is that they were, if they were around today, they would probably use a different word, right? Um, the second uh, coping style was moving against people. And the children who are doing this, these are your bullies. These are the ones that are picking on people um, or they're just very, very assertive. Um, they're uh, as adults, they're uh, likely to um, be loud. They exploit others, they lash out um, because their, their, attendant, their tendencies are, is to be aggressive um, or assertive. I, I think assertiveness, you can be assertive without being aggressive. Um, and then uh, the last one is moving away from people. And for this, this is where a person is like detached and they're, they're isolated. And as adults, they are likely to avoid friendships, intimate friendships, um, intimate romantic relationships. Um, they really uh, avoid interactions with others. Right? So those were her three uh, styles of coping. And like I said earlier, I'm just gonna kind of repeat it. Um, in her mind that most people do this anyway, this is just a, a natural way of coping. And it's, it, it becomes problematic when it um, becomes way out of balance, right? When they're overly using it. Um, all right. So next we're gonna move into uh, the learning approaches and um, uh, we're gonna hit on the behavioral um, perspective first. And the thing that's really cool about uh, learning approaches and I'm sure you've read this in the book, I'm pretty sure there's a question on the homework about it, is that uh, what makes this good is that because learning is observable, we can measure it. And anything we can observe and measure means that we can test it, right? So going back to chapter two, um, looking at the uh, psychological research, this is exactly uh, the behavioral perspective of personality is something that is very testable. Right. So um, if you'll remember B.F. Skinner in the Skinner box, right, um, his theory was is that we learn to behave in particular ways. Um, he also said that, uh, that our personality is shaped by reinforcements and consequences in the environment. So what kind of conditioning would that be? Ooh, pop quiz. What kind of conditioning are we talking about here? Operant, operant Operant conditioning, ding, 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 ding. You are correct. Um, uh, that's exactly right. So our personality is shaped by how we're rewarded um, and, and, and the consequences of our behavior, 
right? That's what he believed. Um, he also believed, um, just like, the, uh, like Erickson, for instance, believed that personality develops throughout our lifetime, right? And that our personality can vary as we experience new situations. And I kind of uh, alluded to that um, in a previous slide as well. Now, Albert Bandura, he's the one that came up with social cognitive theory. Um, and again, this is, this is not new. We talked about this in the, um, uh, I believe it was chapter nine. And, <coughs> and he had some ideas regarding um, factors in how our personalities uh, develop, right? And so first of all, he um, coined the phrase reciprocal determinism. And this involves thinking, right? This is our beliefs, our expectations, what our personality characteristics are. Um, it involves our behavior. And it also involves the context and how they all interact. And so he would say context is key here, right? So what's going on in the environment? What's the stimulus? Um, what's the situation, right? Um, and, what are, and what is the cognitive and behavioral processes that are occurring along with that. Um, also going back to the learning chapter, when you talk about observational learning, or uh, there's also, uh, um, you know, in the social learning as well, we learn by observing someone else's behavior um, and whether or not that person receives a punishment or a reward for that behavior. So, uh, and what this does um, in, in his theory is that it teaches a person um, which behaviors are acceptable. So if this behavior is acceptable, I'm gonna do it, right? Um, and which uh, behaviors are socially unacceptable. So if you'll recall, he was the one that had the Bobo doll experiment as well. So, um, and then self-efficacy, that is our level of confidence in our own abilities. Um, can I um, get this job? Once I get this job, can I do this job, right? Um, so that would be somebody examining their own self-efficacy. What's their level of confidence in accomplishing um, a, a particular task or handling a particular situation? And he also said that these were developed through um, our, our social experiences, right? How we, um, how our interactions go with others. And it also affects how we approach challenges. So here's the idea behind reciprocal determinism. And you'll notice that on this chart, you'll see, uh, let me put on the uh, pen real quick. So remember, we talked about cognitive factors. These are your, your beliefs about the situation um, and uh, your thoughts about it, right? The cognitive processes, uh, situational factors, which is, you know, what's the environment? What's going on in the moment? And then our behavior. And you'll notice that the arrows go back and forth, right? Um, so our behavior, our cognitive processes, and our situal, situational context all influence each other, right? Um, so they, they're, your behavior isn't alone in a bubble, in other words. It is impacted by your cognition, and it's also impacted by your situation. Your situation is impacted by your um, cognition, and it's also impacted by your behavior. So they all, you affect one, you're going to affect the other two. That makes sense. They're all interlinked. Another um, individual that I wanted to talk about here too, um, and I briefly mentioned this, I think it was very brief, so you may or may not remember, when we were talking about intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, motivation in the emotion and motivation chapter. Um, and one of the things that I had kind of briefly mentioned real quick, uh, and then I remembered I was gonna be talking about it again in this chapter, was locus of control. And locus of control is the idea about the belief in the power that I have in my life, 
right? So if I have an internal locus of control, then that means that um, I believe that I have more power in my life to affect different aspects of it, right? Um, so for example, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use a psych exam as an example. An individual with an internal locus of control who does not do as well on the exam as, uh, as they thought they would have, will usually approach it in this manner. They will usually think to themselves, you know what, um, I could have studied harder. Um, you know, I kind of skimped on that one homework assignment. Um, you know, I kind of, uh, I, I didn't do what I normally do, study a little bit each night before, you know, for four nights before the exam. So in other words, they, they're kind of taking like an internal um, responsibility for it. They kind of recognize, okay, what did I do? What could I have done better, right? So this is a person that believes that they have um, power to direct their outcomes. Um, and these individuals tend to perform better academically. Um, they have more career uh, achievement. They're independent. They tend to be healthier um, and they experience um, less depression. A person with an external locus of control tend to believe that the outcomes are outside their, their control. Um, and they believe that, uh, <laughs> they believe in luck. <laughs> I'll give you an example. Um, and sometimes they blame things outside of themselves um, for uh, a situation that they might find themselves in. So going back to the student with the exam, I'm gonna use this as an example. So let's say the student didn't do as well um, on the exam as he or she would have thought, and they have an external locus of control. Well, instead of looking at their study habits, they're gonna go, oh, well, the professor, you know, um, his questions weren't that great, or, you know, he really didn't do, uh, and you, I'm saying he because I'm a he, um, could be a she, whatever. Um, didn't really explain it that well on the lecture, or I asked a question and, and I don't think he really answered it, right? So in other words, um, it's not my fault. It's, it's, it's the professor's fault or the exam was just, you know, set me up to fail, right? So they don't believe that they have any control over it. And if something bad happens to them or if something good happens to them, right? Oh, I had good luck today. I hope I have that tomorrow. Um, rather than going out and kind of creating their own world. So that's locus of control. Uh, a person with an internal locus of control, they're also probably gonna have um, probably, uh, some good intrinsic motivation, um, not worry so much about the external, although we all have intrinsic and extrinsic uh, motivations. Um, they're, they're likely to have pretty high self-efficacy, confidence, that kind of stuff. And then we've also talked about Maslow and Carl Rogers before as well. Um, we saw them in chapter one, and I believe we saw them again in chapter uh, nine. And if you'll recall, now I don't have a picture of it here, but if you'll recall the pyramid, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, uh, and, and that's what he came up with. But his um, contribution to personality was really, he studied um, people that he considered to be healthy people, productive people, um, uh, creative people, right? So for example, I have listed here, right? Albert Einstein, Eleanor Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln. He, he studied them and um, uh, in order to kind of like see how they developed, how their personalities came along. And he found that they shared very similar characteristics. Um, he found that they were open, that they were creative, um, loving, spontaneous, that there was um, concern for others and that they were accepting of themselves. Um, and if you think back to his um, uh, hierarchy of needs, what's on, the what's on the very top of that pyramid? Who remembers what's on the top of that pyramid? Uh, 
achievements or something like that, I think so. Very, very close to that, yes. Self-realization, so, something like that? Self, um, yeah. self-actualization. Self yes, yes. Yeah, self-actualization. Yes, self-actualization is at the very top. And then right underneath that is like esteem needs, right? And so, um, uh, so, so if I was to kind of compare his idea around um, the hierarchy of needs and what he found is for characteristics of um, certain personality types, uh, these personality types, he's kind of describing the, the top of his pyramid, so to speak, right? Um, so I just kind of thought I would kind of point that out. Um, and then Carl Rogers, um, and if you ever hear the term like Rogerian, um, like a Rogerian therapist, someone who's Rogerian is very, very client-centered, um, uh, believes in unconditional positive regard. We did talk about this, I believe, in chapter one. We will talk about it again in the therapy chapter. And we're going to hit on it now, too, because um, Carl Rogers was one of those that he believed that in order for parents to instill um, a high level of congruence um, between their ideal self and, their, and, a, and a child's real self, was that the parents had to provide unconditional um, positive regard. Um, so if you see, so I, I do want you to remember this term. Um, let me see if I have it, should be on, maybe it's not on a slide. Okay, so you're just gonna have to write this note down. So unconditional positive regard um, it is, is how he said we should treat our clients. And it was also how he was talking about, you know, parents um, uh, treating their children, right? But he linked personality with, um, uh, to a person's self-concept. So thoughts and feelings about ourselves, how we think about ourselves, how we feel about ourselves was a determinant of our personality. And he divided the self into two different things. He said, we have an ideal self. And this is um, when I think of, like when I think of who I want to be, right? I have an ideal self, you know, kind, compassionate, uh, you know, good therapist, right? Um, uh, uh, can express empathy, right? Um, and, and I want to believe all of those things about me, right? And and I do think that that is true. And then there's the real self. Who's the person I actually am? And, you know, am I always compassionate? No, I, I might make some mistakes, right? Um, I could have been nicer in a different situation, right? So I, I might look at my real self in that situation. But his idea was, is if I have a high level of congruence, in other words, my ideal self, if you think of a Venn diagram, uh, you know what, I should have created a Venn diagram for this. I don't know why I didn't think about it, but now. For those of you who may not know what a Venn diagram is, a very simple Venn diagram would be two circles. And they're either apart, slightly overlapping, or completely overlapping, right? And that, that's a Venn diagram. And the part where the, where the two overlap is where the congruence would be um, between the ideal self and the um, real self. And the closer those two items are, uh, the more congruent that person feels, the better they feel, they have a greater sense of self-worth, they tend to have a more productive life. If that Venn diagram is really kind of split apart, there, or there's not a whole lot of um, overlap between the real self and the ideal self, then that's where uh, Carl Rogers would say that this individual is maladjusted, right? Um, and then is experiencing difficulties in life based on that maladjustment. So I hope I, that made sense. Um, and I just, I'm gonna actually write myself a note to create a Venn diagram for this because I don't know why I didn't think about that before because it's a great visual representation. I might do it on break real quick and revisit this when we come back real quick, but uh, for those that might not, might not be able to picture what I am saying. 
Is there any questions about the ideal self, the real self, congruence, whether it's high or, or low or uh, congruent or incongruent, I should say? All right. All right, next we're gonna move into the biological um, approaches to personality. Um, and uh, one of the things we're gonna talk about right away is twin studies again. Now we've talked about twin studies a lot. We talked about twin studies when we were talking about sexual orientation, if you'll recall. Talked about twin studies in the, um, in the research chapter. Um, and here it is again. And the reason why twins are, are uh, really um, good for studies is because they have the exact same genetic makeup. They're identical in that way. And what the Minnesota study of twins reared apart found was that identical twins, whether they're raised together, raised apart, their personalities are very similar. Um, uh, there's a, uh, there was a documentary and I might get the name wrong called, I think it was Three Perfect Strangers. It was about triplets that had been raised apart um, uh, for, and didn't even know the others existed. I might get the story a little bit uh, messed up. So don't get too bogged down in my details in case I'm off and you've seen it. But the, but the thing that was really cool was when they finally met and they came together, the, uh, obviously they looked alike, but they, their personalities were very similar. They had very similar interests, careers, hobbies, um, and it was very, very interesting. Um, but that's what the, what the twin studies have found. And what this suggests is that our personalities, part of that, at least half of it, is um, heritable. It's genetic, right? Um, so very, very interesting. And then of course, if you also remember range of reaction, uh, which could account for some differences uh, in personality traits, um, things like that. We've talked about temperament before. Um, and in this particular theory, there's, there's the idea that babies can be organized into one of three temperaments. They're either easy, easy babies, they're difficult babies, um, or they're slow to warm up. Now, don't get this confused with um, like anxious avoidant, um, secure, um, the, the attachment styles. This is another area where um, temperament and attachment uh, can be confused when you're, when you're taking the exam. So uh, make sure that you're able to understand and identify uh, the differences between the two so that when you, so that you recognize it and you know the difference. Um, but two dimensions of temperament that was important to, that's important to adult personality is reactivity and self-regulation. Um, so let's talk about self-regulation first. So self-regulation is basically that ability to uh, control your responses. So, um, you know, if a person is said to be emotionally labile, right? In other words, they're, they're up and down, um, their self-regulation might score low, right? As opposed to someone who's always calm, cool, collected, something happens um, and they, they just, they're, they're just able to maintain that um, regulation. And then of course, reactivity is, uh, and this is really important when you come up with something new or novel, right? Not your everyday thing, but how do you react to an ex uh, environmental stimuli that's either a surprise, that's a challenge, that's new? Um, how do you react to it? Um, so those are the two dimensions. Any questions on that? All right, so next we're gonna talk about, uh, and this, will, this will be the last section that we're gonna, that we're gonna do. I'm gonna wrap this up and then we're gonna go on break. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the trait theorists. 
Normally I show a video here, but I'm going to, um, uh, I believe it's already posted in um, Canvas so you can review it. Um, but we're gonna kind of talk about these real quick. And so first we have um, Gordon um, Allport and he found that there was approximately 4,500 words in the English language that described people. And he basically organized them into three traits. One's cardinal traits. And a cardinal trait is, um, is a trait that dominates a person's personality. So in other words, this is like a, a like, kind of like a one trick pony kind of individual, right? Um, if their cardinal trait is, is that they're just, a, you know, they're just an angry, ornery person, um, that's just how they are all the time. And there's very little changing that. Um, his idea for that was that cardinal traits were, um, were really rare, that you, you don't really um, run into that a lot. Then he had uh, central traits, and um, this is what basically makes up our personality. Um, and, it, and it's a combination of traits, right? And then there was the sec um, secondary traits, which were less obvious, less consistent, um, but would be present under certain circumstances. And then Raymond Cattell came along and um, he took that list and um, he narrowed it. He trimmed it down uh, to about 171 individual traits. And I believe there's a table in your book that has quite a few, few traits. And he identified 16 dimensions of personality, um, which is a lot. And, um, and instead of being uh, present or absent, a uh, person would score on a continuum. Uh, so going back to like what I was talking about with um, introversion versus extroversion um, and all of that in between, this is how he believed as well. The people scored on a continuum. You could be right in the middle, you could be toward one end or toward the other. And you also see that, you'll see that in the five factor um, model and the hexago model, which we're gonna talk about. Now Hans and Sybil Einsack, um, they also focused on introversion versus extroversion. And then they also focused on neuroticism. Again, there's that word again. They don't really um, use, neurotic isn't used that much anymore, um, versus stability, right? So. It, a person is, you know, either they're high in neuroticism, for example, this is a person who is anxious. They're just anxious all the time. Um, they have an overactive sympathetic nervous system. It, it seems like they're always in fight or flight. And if they're high, if they score high in stability, then they're more emotionally stable. Again, those are going to be your individuals that are calm, cool, collected, right? Um, and then of course, introversion and extroversion, we've already talked about, that's kind of why I skipped down um, uh, to the neuroticism versus uh, stability. And then we have the five factor model. Um, and if you remember from the learning chapter, there is a very cool mnemonic that is, uh, uh, I'm gonna put on my laser pointer, which is ocean. Right, And if you use this mnemonic, it will help you remember what the traits are in the five-factor model that is being um, uh, observed or tested, right? And for the five-factor model, so ocean. So we have openness to new experiences. So a person who scores low on that, they're pretty conventional. They like routine. Um, they don't like a lot of changes to that. A person with a high score in openness, they might be very, they're, they're your more curious ones, right? Um, they're independent, they have a, lots of, um, a, a wide range of interests. And then we have conscientiousness. Um, that was a word that I mentioned earlier um, in reference to like uh, birth order. You know, firstborn would be, is probably pretty conscientious, for example. Um, but a person who is, according to the, to the birth order um, theory, um, but a person who is 
uh, conscientious, if they score high on it, they're hardworking, they're dependable, they're the ones that are always going to, to them, uh, a conscientious person, early is on time, on time is late, as an example. They also tend to be very highly organized, right? A person that is low scoring on conscientiousness, they're impulsive, they're careless, you're going to look at them, it's like, no, you're, you're disorganized. Then we have extroversion. And again, here's where introversion and extroversion is showing up again. Now for the five factor model, the word introversion really isn't here, um, but, it, but being the opposite of the high score, the low score is an introvert, the high score is an extrovert. And then there is um, agreeableness. So how cooperative is a person, how trustworthy, how good natured are they, right? they score high, they're very helpful, they're trusting, they score low, they tend to be um, contrarian, <laughs> right? They're critical, they're suspicious, right, of everything. Um, so those are your high and low scores there. And then finally, neuroticism, uh, which, you know, today we might describe more as like uh, anxiousness, right? Um, but scoring high on neuroticism, you're gonna be anxious, unhappy, um, prone to negative thoughts and emotions. Whereas on the other side of that, you score low, score low, sorry, tricked over my tongue. You're going to be more calm, even tempered. This is a person that's, you know, feels secure, et cetera. Um, and remember here, so you'll notice it says scores. Um, this is another area where I, I think the continuum um, uh, also counts well. You know, you could have someone that kind of scores in the middle or trends toward this side, but not all the way, or trends toward the low score, but not all the way, right? It's going to be variations and, and gradations in that. All right. And then last um, is the hexaco traits. And again, you'll see that there's still, there's a lot of similarities between um, many of these models. Um, the difference here is that we haven't seen before is under H, which is the honesty versus humility. Um, and with this, some examples of that would be, you know, a person's authenticity, their sincerity. Um, I actually like the word authenticity, right? Um, modesty, faithfulness, et cetera. Uh, emotionality we've seen before, extroversion we've seen before, agreeableness we've seen before. That's all. All of these are on the five factor model. Openness we have seen before. So, uh, so on the exam, I will want you to be able to recognize different aspects between the five factor model and the hexago model. And um, I will give you a hint that if you see a question, uh, about the difference, this one's probably this. This is going to be the main difference, right? Is the addition of uh, honesty versus humility. So just be able to recognize the difference between those two. If again, if you read it fast, you'll see a lot of the five factor model is represented here, right? You'll see a lot of the same things. Professor, the hexagon model is that on the. Um... Um, a slide that you presented, I can find them. Uh, actually, it is not. Um, I, I just realized it's not because I added this slide after I created those uh, whatchamacallits. So I'm going to leave this up for a minute. Thank you for pointing me for pointing that out. I did forget to um, update that. So my apologies for that. So Take a minute, take a picture of the screens, just so you have it, um, make your notes. Um, it is also in your book um, right after the five factor model. So you do have access to this exact same thing in your book. And actually this is also the result of uh, newer research too. Um, I think the uh, book um, references research that was done in 2018 around these hexaco traits. So. 
All right. And then, um, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I thought that was the last section. I forgot about cultural understandings of personalities and some very interesting things around culture um, that we're gonna talk about real quick, right? So um, first, I think it's important to um, define culture. I think we've done it before, right? But, but a culture is the beliefs, the customs, the arts, the traditions, um, you know, that, that's uh, involved around a particular society, right? Um, and so the question that, that, that um, researchers ask are, are personality traits the same across cultures or are there variations? And what we found is that there are, there are cultural specific aspects that account for variation in personality. Um, and then there's also universal um, aspects that are, are, that are found in um, personality. And so if we think about, um, for instance, collectivist versus individualist uh, societies, right? Um, the United States, real quick, the United States is what kind of culture, if we were gonna label it between collectivist or individualist? Where do you, where somebody shout it out? Where are we? Or maybe we don't know. We're diverse. <laughs> the mix of different culture we are here. Y yes, um, I, I, and I can see where you are coming from. But overall, the United States is pretty much an individualistic. Now, yes, there are um, uh, collective, collectivist cultural aspects to it, right? So if we think about like Asian cultures or Central and South American cultures, um, which we have a lot of here in the United States, don't we, right? Um, in California, you know, we have, um, you know, the Mexican American uh, population, which, um, you know, there's some collectivist aspects to that. Um, Asian cultures tend to be more collectivist. They think of, you know, uh, the group as a whole, as, a, as opposed to, you know, the individual is things. Um, Europeans, Merrick, uh, you know, uh, I, let me put it to you this way, probably more Caucasian Americans, probably more focused on individualistic um, uh, ideas, right? So this is another interesting finding um, regarding regional differences in personality. And what they found is that there is basically three different types of clusters. Um, and they proposed or they uh, posited the idea of selective migration, that people choose to move to places where that are more compatible with their personality and their needs. So for example, let me turn on my uh, pen here, right? So here we are, Southern California, right? Um, and in Southern California, the, the, the cluster tends to be um, very relaxed or creative. Um, that, that, that's how it is. Whereas uh, like in the Northeast, um, that tends to be more temperamental. Um, the, uh, in the Northeast, they tend to be more stressed, more depressed, more irritable. Um, it was just some interesting clusters that they found in, in doing their research. So um, it's kind of kind of kind of cool looking at this. And it's an interesting um, uh, explanation using selective migration that people choose to move uh, to places that are compatible with their personalities. All right, so let's talk about uh, collectivist versus individualist. Um, uh, cultures. So individualist cultures, they value independence, right? Um, you're not gonna, well, <laughs> I have to be careful. I almost said something that might've been controversial, um, but you're not gonna tell me what to do, right? Um, uh, th there's a high level of um, competition. There's a lot of stress um, placed on personal achievement. Um, and it's mainly in Western nations, right? Um, the United States, England, 
Western Europe, um, Australia, and uh, you know, personality oriented person. I mean, these traits are are ingrained in our personalities, right? Um, and then with collectivist cultures, they tend to value more social harmony, respectfulness, um, the group's needs over individual needs. And you're, you're gonna find a lot of this mainly in, in Asia, Africa, and South America, right? So, um, so for instance, um, a person in South Korea is probably going to be experiencing um, what kind of um, culture in South Korea? Individualist? No, that would be collectivist. That was a good, good, good guess, right? Um, but no, they they tend to be more collectivist there, in in, in South Korea, right? So um, uh, same thing with Japan and China, right? Um, Southeast Asia, like um, Cambodia, for instance, uh, which I visited. Also visited Indonesia. So um, very, you know, collectivist. So, so if you think of US, the United States, sorry, same thing, England, Western Europe, that's pretty much individualist. Um, Australia is individualist. Um, but those other places like China, you know, think of different nations in Africa, like South Africa, uh, Namibia, places like that. They're gonna be more collectivist. Costa Rica in Central America, Brazil, uh, in South America, um, Peru, more collectivist than individualist. And that concludes uh, chapter 11. And um, so I'm gonna stop the recording. Hold on, because my pen is still on and Somebody is blowing up my text as well. I don't know if you guys can hear that, but um, 